Hi, my name is Elisa Camahort Page, and my favorite TV show ever is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Welcome to the Finding Favorites podcast, where we explore your favorite things without using an algorithm. Here's your host, Leah Jones. Hello, and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and it is Sunday, May 9th. Mother's Day in North America, which can be a wonderful day for some and a very difficult day for others, um, depending on your relationship with your mom and the moms in your life. For me, I have a really good relationship with my mom. I'm really grateful for that. Hi, mom. She's listening. And if you're a guest, she has probably sent you some replies, some follow-up questions or follow-up answers. Um, One of my biggest cheerleaders and... I miss her a lot. Um, Today's interview is with Elisa Camelhort Page. Elisa is a entrepreneur and consultant. She's a blogger, podcaster, writer, author. She's got a book out, um, and I know her from the earliest days of Blog Her, uh, a, a, a women's blogging conference from back in the day. So this episode is about, we talk a little bit about her book, and then we talk a lot about Buffy the Vampire Slayer and how to make peace with a piece of art when the creator turns out to be a bad person. So Buffy the Vampire Slayer was created by Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon has, in the last couple years, is starting to I don't know if he's actually been held accountable yet, but people are starting to come forward about his abusive tactics on set um, from as early as Buffy through to the Justice League. Just last night, a story broke um, in the Israeli press in an interview with Gal Gadot, who plays Wonder Woman, that Joss Whedon had threatened her and Patty Jenkins' careers if she didn't, if they didn't let him change Wonder Woman's uh, her storyline and and who she is as a character. But there's a lot of stories about Joss Whedon being abusive on set, um, making toxic work environments. And so we talk about what happens when the art you loved in your teens and 20s, as an adult, you find out the creator is uh, bad news and was abusive and was abusing the artist, was abusing the actors you loved during that show. We don't come up with any great answers, but we do talk about it. So I don't want you to, hopefully you, you're not looking at this thinking like, how can Leah have a, a, a Joss Whedon love fest how can how can this be happening? Didn't she see the news last night? We did record this a few weeks ago, so we did record this before the Gal Gadot Patty Jenkins news was public. Um, so it, it wasn't we didn't know the latest, but we knew we suspected more bad news was coming because things are just starting to come to light about him. So just know that going in. We, we talk about it. We try to grapple with it a little bit. Some of the other artists that have been held accountable for, for their abusive behavior or, or illegal or behavior on set and near set or, or with their celebrity. Um, but th- we also talk about all of the important life lessons that you can get from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, and we try to brainstorm some ways that you can watch it without putting money back into Joss Whedon's pocket, which is a difficult one. Happy Mother's Day, if it is a happy day for you. Um, make space for yourself if it's a difficult day. Take care of yourself and uh, stay safe. Keep wearing those masks uh, when it's appropriate. Hard to have a catchy tagline these days. But um, stay safe and be kind. Hello. 
Hello and welcome to Finding Favorites. I'm your host, Leah Jones, and this is the podcast where we learn about people's favorite things and get recommendations without using an algorithm. So today I am with one of the OG OGs of women on the internet in my life. Um, I have today Elisa Camelhart Page. She is an on- author and entrepreneur who I met for the first time next to a pool in San Jose at the fir- at the second ever blog her convention. How are you doing today? I am doing great, Leah. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. Yeah, that was a long time ago. I didn't realize Blog Her 06 was your first Blog Her. I thought maybe because you were in Chicago, I always assumed it was Blog Her 07 when we went to Chicago. No, I was uh, at Edelman at the time. Uh, I was was not on the Butterball team, but I did have to do some of the Butterball cleanup. Oh, that Butterball (laughs) pot holder. I still use it. It was a Listen, good pot holder. I you need pot holders. Yes. If you're gonna cook a turkey, Listen, and you, you gotta need put a pot- you can't put a frozen turkey in your luggage to take home. No. That so, mm-mm. Yeah. So I was good on times. the on the, the <laughs> butterball oven mitt crisis team. <laughs> Uh, it's funny to say it out loud. Yeah, times have changed. Indeed. Yeah. So we have been in and out of each other's orbits ever since then. And a couple years ago, when you were on your book tour um, for your book, Roadmap for Revolutionaries, we got to see each other and reconnect in Chicago at your event at the Colvin House. Yes, that was a great space. That was back in the days when you could meet in person, all my poor friends doing virtual book things now. Um, but yeah, that was, that was fantastic. And it was great to see you in real life. I don't know how long it had been before then, but probably a little while. Yeah, it had been, it had been some time. You are, you're hosting the op-ed project podcast now. You are, uh, what else is going on in your life? No, you're Uh not. The op-ed project is a real thing run by Katie Ornstein, but yes. this is the op-ed page, as in my name, the op-ed page. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Oh, now I get it. Yeah, it's my name, the yeah. op-ed page. <laughs> See how that works? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so you have been hosting the op-ed page, which is your podcast. Um, yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, somewhat like you, I, last year, um, I started a couple of new things. Um, you know, as someone who's a, mostly a consultant and speaker, mm-hmm. you know, that's after I left um, the company that acquired BlogHer in 2017, I did the book and I did the book came out in 2018, did a bunch of book stuff. Um, and I've been consulting and coaching and speaking and When the pandemic hit, like all most of that just completely evaporated. Yeah. Um, So I started a podcast at the beginning of last year, the Up at Page, which is just my weekly look at things that are catching my eye. I'm very interested in politics, pop culture. Obviously, I became interested in the pandemic, but technology, activism. So it's really just very different every week. But what sort of things I'm paying attention to? I also started a newsletter. you know, this weekish, yeah. stealing a stealing a line from John Oliver, sort of. You know that 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 kind of approach. And again, it's just you know, um, I just wanted to find. I'm I'm looking for other ways to share besides on Facebook. Let's just be honest. That's what yeah. I'm really looking to do. Um, I don't want to give my best content and thinking to Facebook anymore. The thing I like about the newsletter is that it a- operates somewhat like a blog post. Uh, in that someone can come and comment on it. We can have a conversation. You can share it like it's a blog. You know, I had tried using Medium and just did not find that to be that enthralling. So the podcast and the newsletter are a way uh, for me to share content and share what I'm thinking about, um, share what I think is my best thinking without giving it to some social media platforms that I don't want to have it. 
Yeah. And I'm not convinced that, you know, the, where I do my newsletter, I'm not convinced that's the best platform for that, but I can always switch it later. You know, yeah. it's, it's not a huge deal. So, so I'm really happy that I'm doing both those things. Yeah. It has been interesting. The podcast for me was, yeah, I needed, I think I needed to have like, well, one, because mine's all interviews, it, it means I'm having a conversation with at least one person a week that is not about, it, it's always a little bit about the pandemic, but it's not about the synagogue where I've been volunteering as president. It's not about, um, it's not about the things that cause incredible stress or that I feel like I'm spinning my wheels about. I interview people about things they love. Yeah. And people don't always get to talk for an hour about the thing they love. So it's been really fun. But I also think for people, you know, I started blogging in 2003. Yeah, me too. You know, I was on and looking for, you know, what's the new, what, what is it's, I'm no longer, thank God, I'm no longer someone who chases every login. I don't chase every beta. I don't care. I just, <laughs> turns out that's not my hobby. Um. <laughs> But I do miss the the relationship building that was there in that decade or so. And um, and I still my deepest friendships are people that I met in those the, you know, before the algorithm truly like took over what we what we see and what we engage right. with. Right. So true. Yeah. Well, that's that's fantastic. And, and do you find the, um, and you said that sometimes you're doing interviews for the podcast? Sometimes I do interviews. Sometimes it's just me talking for a half hour. Mm -hmm. um, I think interviews sometimes get a little more, I mean, people like interviews. Um, I, you know, I probably overestimate how much people want to hear me just rant about something for 30 <laughs> minutes, but that's okay. I'm, you know, the best, the best work is the authentic work. And sometimes I just really need to rant for 30 minutes. Yeah. But, but yeah, you know, and the interviews even are kind of all over the place. I meet a yeah. lot of interesting people. And sometimes I just want to share what they're talking about and doing with other people. And yeah. that's a great way to do it. And how is that? How did you feel about the it, I, I'm so glad for you that your book, I mean, your book was so powerful. Well, thank um, you. I very quickly, I believe, regifted it to uh, one of my nephews who was at the beginning of their political activist life. Yes. Yeah. Um, I felt like it was a really, really powerful for them. And I'm curious because it was, that was 2018 midterms. I forget if it came out before or after midterms. Just but, before September of 2018. Okay. Have you continued to have conversations with people about the book? Have you continued to hear from people about the impact? Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite, um, when TikTok first started blowing up, someone in New York recorded a TikTok of them deciding they were going to run for New York. I think it was city council yeah. for their borough. Um, and they were holding up the book and pointing to it like, you know, uh, and had some cool music and, um, you know, basically, cause I didn't know this person. Um, so yeah. I think they really just read the book and said, yeah, I'm going to try that. Yeah. And in fact, I'm having a, on clubhouse this, this week, I'm, I'm doing a room with somebody who wants to talk about, you know, how to help people get started in activism by using the book. So I think it's a perennially, uh, relevant topic. Mm -hmm. And we did, we did go to the effort of it. It is not about, wasn't about Trump. Wasn't right. even really about influencing Congress too much because there, you know, you can go to Indivisible if you want to learn about the best ways to influence Congress. It right. was much more um, big picture on all the ways you can affect change that you might not even be thinking about that are really meaningful, um, like workplace policies or your kids' schools policies or local governance, which yeah. I have made it my personal, um, dis, you know, my personal commitment that I'm going to stay pick a local issue to get really educated about, know more about, and um, not just one, but I'm, I have to pick at least one that I'm going to really focus on, which I have done, which I have picked, yeah. and um, and know who my local representatives are and what they stand for and reach out to them and attend their office hour. They're all doing office hours on Zoom now. 
Right. You know, my yeah. city council person is, my county board supervisor is, my, you know, like all these people are. So I actually attend. Um, oh, that's outstanding. And I attend neighborhood meetings and, you know, all these things. So, so the book is really much more about how to, to make impact in a lot of different ways you might not be thinking about and how sometimes that can feel a lot closer to seeing the impact of what you're doing. Yeah. One of the organizations I volunteer with is the New Politics Academy. They do a program called, um, it's called, it, it is Answering the Call. And so it's for military vets and, and people who are alumni of other public service or service corps. So AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, military, Teach for America, that you, about if you're interested in running for office. And it's this five-week program that's a, a soul searching to figure out if, if running for office is, mm-hmm. is how you're called to serve. And through that, I got to meet James Tallarico, who is a, a state rep in Texas outside of Austin. And he's like, I'm not interested in national politics. He's like, I'm staying in Texas, local Texas politics. He was like, it's not a ladder that I'm trying to climb. He was like, I had students in this district and I need to make their lives better. And so my goal is to change things at the state level in Texas. And it was really, um, it's very cool to meet those local politicians. I Our city council in Chicago, I mean, Chicago is just a, just a wild <laughs> Show. <laughs> um, but we have an alderman who's uh, in his early 40s was a hip hop guy and who ousted a, an Irish alderman who'd been in his office for over 30 years. Wow. So Chicago's at the city council level is getting really exciting. And and so the like local politics at the neighborhood level uh, I think especially since then, since your book and in these last four years, realizing and knowing Kelly Hurst, of course, how important a local school board is, how important what happens in the two schools across the street from my apartment are. Um, this is what I always say. When when your police department um, – doesn't have policies against chokeholds or doesn't have policies requiring body cams to be on. Those are policies that are made by one of your neighbors. Mm -hmm. When your local school has a dress code that's inherently sexist or maybe racist, Mm -hmm. those are decisions made by one of your neighbors. Yeah. There are really important things that happen driven by local governance, whether it's school boards, city councils, board of supervisors, commissions, committees, um, there are really important decisions being made by people who are your neighbors. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I hope people keep seeing that it's not about winning one office at the top. Yeah. It's about every, it's everything local, hyper-local, um, where you can build, I think, real effective change. 100%. Yeah. As we were talking about things to talk about tonight, uh, you picked another change maker <laughs> to talk about, a, 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 and that is uh, the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and also how you have held on to it given the creators, what we've learned about the creator in the last few years. So is that still, Buffy is still on the table for tonight? Yes, we can talk about Buffy. In fact, I'm I'm happy to kind of talk through this this um you know, the how I've had to evolve my thinking about it as it became clear just how much of an asshole Joss Whedon apparently is yeah. and how much of an asshole he was to women that On I that love set. because of their participation, women who make that show for me. Mm-hmm. You know, he doesn't make that show for me. They make that show for me. Right. Um, you know, I think I was telling you before we started that the book I wrote about activism was instigated by the election in 2016 and by one of the co-authors, Carolyn Duran, who came to me with this idea mm-hmm. for a book. And I said, sure, 
I mean, I'm always, I'm a yes person typically. Yes. Yeah. We do stuff. I say yes. Um, and it wasn't the book that when I had gone to the powers that be at the company that acquired Blogger and said it was time for me to start transitioning out, I had mentioned, I think I want to work on writing a book. I just don't think I'll do it if I'm working full time. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't the book. The book I had had in mind was to write about leadership lessons I learned from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, okay. And that got put on the back burner and we wrote this other book. And then writing a book is is not easy. And what's even less easy is what comes after the book is published when it's really on, unless you're a very, very big celebrity, it's really on you to try and get that book sold. And it's a lot right. of, it's a lot of hustle and it's a lot of pressure. And um, so I've had the idea in my mind for this Buffy book for years and haven't, hadn't quite triggered myself to go do it. And so then when this news came out, and for those of you who don't know, there had been some news some years ago, Joss Whedon's ex-wife said he was a jerk and implied he was unfaithful. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, that was it, you know, and I think for most people, maybe I'll just speak for me as I always advise other people to do. For me, I looked at that and I'm like, ah, I, first of all, I knew other people that knew him and thought he was great. I know someone who went to college with him. I know someone, he's a big supporter of their nonprofit and he, they think he's awesome. And so I thought, well, God, if I, if I decided that everyone whose ex spouse thinks they're a jerk uh, is off the table, that's going to be a lot of people. It, even if you say, okay, if everyone who's ever been unfaithful is off the table, that's a lot of people too, right. according to the stats we see. So I was like, Okay, you know, I'm sure she's right. I'm sure he was a dick to her. Like, but, but I don't know. You know, it's just it, it, I was able to rationalize. So that, that was fine. Uh, but then this last year, uh, basically, one of the actresses who was both on Buffy and then went with him to the spinoff Angel, mm -hmm. um, uh, who played Cordelia, and I don't oh Charisma Carpenter. Her name almost left my mind. She basically wrote a long post talking about how abusive he was on set, mm -hmm. verbally, emotionally, manipulative, abusive. Uh, and then other actresses either concurred, mm -hmm. Amber Benson, who played Tara, Michelle Trachtenberg, who played Dawn, or supported those women who were saying this. So even Sarah Michelle Geller was like, good for you. I support you. And I'm what she said was so interesting. I'm proud to have my name associated with Buffy. I'm not proud. I don't want my name forever associated with Joss Whedon. Yeah. And that's, she was his girl, right? She was right. star. And the only people who haven't, so almost everybody in the cast came out either agreeing or supporting, except mm -hmm. for just a very small number. Um, and I look at the, I give them side eye, you know, um, and the stories were just, you know, there's still a lot of stuff that hasn't been said. I mean, when you've got Michelle Trachtenberg saying, Trachtenberg saying that um, after a certain, I don't know, incident or time period, he wasn't allowed to be alone in a room with her. And she mm. was an early teenager. Fuck. You know, right. they haven't said anything more, but it does not sound good. Yeah, and, we, um, we all have memories of like, the one dad, maybe everybody's parent, the, we had like one neighborhood dad that if only the dad was home, we weren't, we are, we weren't allowed to go in that house. Oh, like there was that one. So I think we all know that when, when you're saying this child is not allowed to be alone in a room with this adult. Yeah. It's not good. It's not good. Doesn't mean anything good. So all of this goes down. It's it's heartbreaking. I mean, it it was deeply upsetting to me and it's heartbreaking to imagine that these women that I admire mm -hmm. so much were undergoing, it was not um, a good experience. In fact, there's even an interview, an old interview surfaced of Freddie Prinze Jr. talking about Sarah Michelle and how much she basically, how much people, how much, not people, how much Whedon and producers should just appreciate how long she stuck around because it was not cool. Like it wasn't a, Oh wow. You know, it's very veiled. Everything's mm -hmm. very veiled, but, um, so, so all of that happens and, um, 
I'm like, well, there goes my book idea. I can never publish that now, except for, um, you know, I, I, what I, I, I think I said is that I guess my first lesson I learned from Buffy the Vampire Slayer is don't have heroes. Mm-hmm. You know, never, never be blinded to human nature disappointing you. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that even people that you trust uh, can occasionally really let you down. Mm-hmm. And there, are, and when I think about Buffy's storylines, the thing I love about Buffy, if I can you know, say why I do love Buffy. Yes. Yeah. Um, Buffy's the best television show on ever in my mind. Um, and I like TV a lot. I mm-hmm. mean, Ted Lasso might be, might be knocking it off. Oh, but let's Lasso, see how, yeah. Let's see how season two does. But te- season one blew me wide open. I yeah. loved that. I, I um, need to give it a second watch. I, I finally I, saw I watched it. the whole thing on New Year's Day all at once just to start the year off right. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, and I think it was the best because the overarching messages were so deep and strong and, um, and it was in this package that was fun and, uh, you know, kind of a genre show, you know, right. for a uh, teenage. And so the subversiveness of really co- combining really deep messaging with a really on the surface, superficial package. And there was so much fan service in the show. If you watch that whole show, there were Easter, there were always callbacks and references. Yeah. You were rewarded for being a fan. There were a million times where you're like, you're only going to catch that little thing if you have watched every episode. Okay. And so that's, you know, I, that's that kind of fan service is really fun. And it's tons of that, but the overarching themes, and this is so ironic. One of the themes that I loved in this show, one of the reasons I love it is because uh, Buffy, who starts out a sophomore in high school, so theoretically 15, 16, yeah. the show ran um, seven seasons and Giles was her, the watcher. Uh, right. Every every slayer has a watcher who's like their mentor. Is and, Giles the one that was super blonde or was that Angel? Well, so I, I know I know Buffy essentially from Tumblr memes. I have never oh. seen a single episode. Spike Somehow, and Angel. I don't know how. Okay. Spike and Angel were two vampire boyfriends she had, which of course caused a lot of conflict because she's a vampire okay. slayer. You know, God. so it's kind of like, oh, vampire loves vampire yeah. slayer and vice versa. No, Giles was the librarian at the school. Mm-hmm. And it was in a really interesting casting choice. They chose someone who for a grown up lady is dev- was devastatingly handsome and sexy yeah. Anthony um head who was in Ted Lasso coincidentally he played um Ooh. he played Rebecca's ex-husband the oh you know yeah. consider he's he's older now but I, he's sure. still kind of a snack but yeah. he was and they had episodes where they found ways to make him pretty snackish um but there was never an iota of sexual tension or chemistry between him and Buffy what a relief and I can't, what, what a, a relief, relief. Yes, I can't think of too many shows where you don't have to worry about the young girl and the mentor eventually fighting their romantic feelings for each other. Yeah. Um, and have you, and they just, did you watch The Queen's Gambit? I did. Every, I did not realize how much I braced myself waiting for a sexual assault until I watched that show. Because every time a man... The custodian yes. puts a hand on the on her friend's shoulder, and you're like, "Oh, it's about to happen." Yes, this, and the whole show, like there would be these these long touches, and it's just just a good guy, just being a good dude, and it was the most shocking thing about that show. Yes, although we could have a whole other conversation about that show, but yeah. um, but yes, it was a relief, and and also I think it was interesting because several years in. They addressed it sort of because another watcher shows up, also a British man, mm-hmm. also a little older, but not old, you know, like in his, their teenagers, you know, he and Giles and Wesley are in their thirties, maybe early forties at the oldest, yeah. you know, I mean, when I look back at some of my te- favorite teachers, they were not that much older than me. Right. I thought of them as like ancient, but they were probably like my favorite, one of my favorite teachers in college was probably 37, you know, and, and, 
and I was of course 20 or whatever, but I just thought of him as like an old guy teacher, but I'm like, Oh my God, he was like, uh, yeah. that's not the case. Anyway. So Wesley comes along. He does have a flirtation with, um, coincidentally charisma carpenter's character and they when she turns 18 they you know she flirts back with him and they briefly you know decide oh we're at this school dance i think yeah and it's immediately played off as oh no we don't really yeah. actually want to do this no, right sorry this is wrong and um so that's how that topic is kind of addressed and dismissed but with giles and buffy it truly was never there was never any hint of it mm -hmm. and I love that. And it's ironic given what we learn later, but, but really the overarching themes of Buffy, which I think are great lessons for life is that she never, despite having superpowers, mm -hmm. she, every season had a, what they call a big bad. I mean, this is common yeah. video gaming language or other, but it's a big kind bad of a, over there's like the season storyline and then there's a monster yes. of the week and teenage yeah, romance so like, and X-Files sort of did it differently. They had monster episodes and they had mythology arc episodes. So okay. For them, it wasn't necessarily a big one big bad per season. It was more like a mythology over the whole show. Okay. But not every episode dealt with the mythology because that would have gotten super old. Right. And needed to space it out. So they would have monster of the week episodes. So Buffy had big bads and then had individual monster of the weeks as well. Okay. And every big bad that was ever defeated, she did not defeat on her own with her superpowers. She always needed her Scooby gang, her, mm -hmm. her Giles and Cordelia and, you know, her fellow students, a vampire or two, you know, who are working on her side or, yeah. you know, she had a team, the Scooby gang, that's what mm -hmm. they were called. And inevitably they played heavily into how the big bad gets defeated and it required teamwork and sacrifice. Okay. And, and those themes were about that. I think so important, um, to learning how to deal with big issues is right. You don't have to go it alone. And sometimes you don't get the ideal outcome, but right. you know, you get the best possible outcome and, and sometimes you won't get you what you want, but that's okay because you got something that was greater than that. Yeah. Um, and there were um, heavy sacrifices that were made. And I think it's also so interesting that out of the seven seasons, two out of the seven seasons, the most hapless, le least skilled Scooby gang member is the one who actually can make the ultimate difference. Mm -hmm. you know, because ultimately Willow, her best friend begins to have witch, witch capabilities. Okay. And then she's got, you know, another friend who's really a werewolf. She's got her vampire friends. She's got like, she's got Giles who knows magic and, you know, all these things. But the one friend Xander doesn't have a special skill, doesn't develop one. He's very hapless through the mm -hmm. whole series. But at the end of the day, it's his just basic humanity and his ability to be a human who loves. Yeah. You know, um, breaks through and helps make the difference to defeating that season's big bad. And so I, I thought um, that's what I really loved about it, that it was so much bigger than what it appeared to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it actually had really good messages. A lot of, a lot of people talk about how it's taking the monsters, the internal demons of adolescence yeah. and manifesting them. Um, and I think that that is true. But I think it was much more for me, what much more made it so appealing was the humanity. Mm -hmm. the, the, I watched it uh, for a whole uh, second time, 10 years, probably the first time I watched it was in the 90s, late 90s. So did you, did you watch it when it was on TV the first time? I didn't catch it in the first season. I think okay. I came to it. And the first season is the one where you got to, everyone will tell you, oh, you know, got to make it through the first season, but okay. it really becomes what it is in the second season. And I would agree with that. Although I find the first season perfectly entertaining, but I did watch it in the late nineties, early aughts when it was, you know, I was waiting every week to watch right. Buffy. Um, and then I watched, I started watching it again when I was thinking about this book. And it's so interesting because I wasn't a teenager when I first watched it, but sure. I was in my, I don't know, earlier thirties, yeah. mid thirties. Then I want, you know, you watch it later when I was most definitely middle-aged and I saw different things. I saw the interplay of the adult characters mm -hmm. and I 
found different poignant moments that I hadn't really noticed the first time yeah. around. So I feel like combined with the fan service element, I think the la- there are layers there that make it really interesting. Mm-hmm. It's not just, I think some people kind of perceived it because especially because it was on the WB as like a angsty, angsty teenage show, like Dawson's Creek or whatever. But I yeah, actually you thought could, it. You could throw it in pretty easily with, with Dawson's Creek, Gilmore yeah. Girls, Veronica Mars. Yes. Like soap opera, teenage, uh, the girls in the, there's, there's a girl, a power, an empowered girl and yes. it's a soap opera. Yeah. So, um. So, yeah, so I, I just found different, you know, different layers to it when I watched mm-hmm. it late, much later. I will say the one thing, Joss Whedon, you know, because he wrote the earliest episodes, there's a tone and, and a kind of whip smart, pop culture snappy rejoinder, mm-hmm. really super fun um, embodiment of like teen speak, but in this totally different environment. And, you know, that is something I do believe he brought to the table with it, you know, that he started the show. But as the show went on, there were plenty of other writers and directors and, you know, he was very involved the whole time. And, you know, so I probably would think twice before I bought anything again that would put, I, you know, I would research whether it was going to put money in his pocket. Right. To buy something. Um, Does he get money if you buy I don't know what, I don't know what you could buy, but does well, he get like money? Well, like if you, if you buy, buy used DVDs, he's not going to get money. Ah, good to know. I think right? I already have the DVDs. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, but if you, if you did a rental on any of the streaming services, it's going to get back to him, right? Even if it's a, it's free right now on, on Hulu, I think. You don't have to pay extra. Okay. I don't know how to know how the models for those things work. But yeah. that would be the kind of thing per my books, chapter three, economic pressure. I yeah. care very much about who gets my money. And before I did anything that I thought would give him money, the problem is it also gives the actors money. It also gives right. you know, it gives everybody money. And they were being treated terribly and like, so I don't want them not to have money. It's very difficult <laughs> right. to make these decisions. It's so funny because in in the past, a lot of people who um, folks have kind of learned bad shit about and then, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't like to use the term cancel culture because I don't believe anyone's being canceled. They're being held accountable for behavior. And right. I'm making my I'm making my market choice. Right. I'm, I'm exercising my market choice. But previously, when whether it was Michael Jackson or R. Kelly or mm-hmm. um, Woody Allen or yeah. Roman Polanski or, hey, Richard Wagner, who was a yep. notorious anti-Semite. Yep. And people would say, well, how can you know you can separate the art from the artist because everybody's problematic. And I, I really had a stock opinion on this, which is everybody's problematic, sure, but some people just make it really easy to know how problematic they are. Right. And it's hard not to know that. And I'm just like, there are other movie directors. There's other, if you like opera, there are thousands of other, you know, maybe not thousands. I don't know. There are lots of other operas. There, there are, are lots, lots of, other, of other operas. Lots right. of other movies to watch, lots of other R&B to listen to, lots of other, you know, whatever your case may be. Um, but that was pretty easy for me to say because it never happened to someone I was so invested in before. Yeah. I was yeah. not a super fan of any of those people I just named or anyone else I can think of. I think the was. one that has been the hardest for me to, of like, oh man, I really got to, uh, is like Bill Cosby. Um, I watched, I watched Bill Cosby live. We had taped, you know, taped it off of HBO on and I anytime a friend is pregnant, I want to go zuff wuff whiff wuff push push, right? Anytime <laughs> I have chocolate cake, I think dad is great. Give a there's so much Bill Cosby like deeply implanted in my brain wow. that I start to say to people and I'm like, oh nope, we're not we're not doing that now. And so far he's the creator. Cause like Woody Allen, I, he's been gross my whole life. Right. Right. <laughs> like I've I, I knew he was gross before I converted to Judaism so I never had to fall into like that nebishy Jewish movie thing so so but but there are you know I, I certainly have 
you know, I listen to a lot of comedy podcasts and there's a lot of podcasters now that if that I would really I would lose. There's some there's some like, you know, so I worry about it. But I hear you that when you watch other people being held accountable, but you don't love their art, you don't have to wrestle right. with actually divorcing yourself from their art or finding a way to right. live with it. Right. Right. So the question is, the question still remains, can I write this book with a new chapter of like how the first lesson I learned, you know, the most important, not first, obviously, but most important lesson to learn from Buffy the Vampire Slayer is don't have heroes that people are going to let you down. And that's kind of a depressing thing for a book. Right. <laughs> it's kind of a depressing chapter, but, um, but it's well, a but depressing thing have, that happened. You can have, I think you can have heroes, but you shouldn't have idols. I think there's a difference. Um, that's interesting. Right? That you okay. don't. A okay. hero is okay. a person. Yeah. And so, and your hero can disappoint you. But yeah. an idol is someone you put truly like, right? Idols are golden calves. They're, yeah. they, they are God-like. And, and so it's about not having idols, don't don't turn your heroes into idols because then when they disappoint you, like that is identity crushing. Yeah. But a human you admire also being a human and a bad human is different than an idol being crushed. That is a very interesting perspective. I will have to roll around in my yeah. brain for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, he's because Joss Whedon's work was work that I followed. I, you know, yeah. I was going to watch, I was going to watch, like he has a show right now on HBO that before all this came out, it was Joss Whedon's The Nevers and like all about it. They took his name. I don't know what the credits say because I haven't watched it. Right. And it's about empowered, magical women in like Victorian England. And I'm like, I'm all oh, about that life. Yes. And I haven't, I haven't watched it. Mm. And then, they've taken his name out of all the promos, and mm -hmm. which I just think is disingenuous. Like, you didn't cancel the show; you're right. still running the show. You're just hoping nobody figures out that it's Joss Whedon. It's it's pretty chicken. Yeah, and then he, uh, like, I know he had some, he had some Star Wars stuff. He had some Star Trek stuff. Like, he also is in like all of the major. Well, or did he have well, Star that's J.J. Abrams? I think you're thinking of J.J. Abrams, who's oh. done both Star Trek and Star Wars. No, but he was he Avengers. Also, he was Avengers. So, OK. No, I don't know anything about J.J. Abrams. Joss Whedon directed the Avengers, directed some of the follow on Avenger movies. We did just watch the whole the beginning of the pandemic. My significant other and I watched all 23 Marvel Universe movies, Avengers movies in a row oh my just for something to do each night. Um, yeah. And he directed some of them. And that's when this stuff first started coming out. An African-American mm -hmm. actor who was in Justice League, which is a DC movie, but nonetheless, you know, Joss Whedon directed Justice League after Zack Snyder had to leave for I forget what reason. And this actor basically came out and complained that he was abusive on set to him and treated him terribly. And Charisma Carpenter brought up her experience to, she was deposed in his oh. lawsuit. And then she came, went public with okay. having supported him and being deposed. And that's what started is actually his, his work on justice. The League. Justice League. Um, okay. That, yeah. that's how I have it in my head because I listened to probably three or four. I had, I have not watched the Snyder cut. But I have listened to probably Neither. six or seven. It's four hours seven. long, man. <laughs> it's four hours long. I can't keep Marvel and DC straight in my head. But that's why I thought he was Star Trek and Star Wars was he's actually some DC and Marvel crossover. Yes. Yes. So. DC and he's, he's playing both sides in the DC Marvel world. Yeah. What are some other key, uh, not to not to give away the whole book <laughs> before you write it, but what are some of the other are um, either key lessons or if someone can find a way to watch it that doesn't put money in Joss Whedon's pocket, where do you think somebody should start that doesn't 
if, if you're a Leah Jones who's somehow never seen an episode of Buffy. I can't believe it. It's really um, shocking, honestly. It is really shocking. <laughs> Uh, I mean, if it were me, I would tell anyone to start at the beginning and watch it because of that fan service that's throughout. You'll be okay. Um, but there are some episodes that really stand out. Um, one of the episodes that I think is so pertinent today um, is called Earshot. And it uh, Buffy gets like slimed by some demon and begins to realize that it has given her this power to hear what people are thinking. Mm. And at first that's kind of fun. Like she knows what people are saying about her or thinking about her. She knows stuff and, but it becomes a cacophony and it begins to drive her pretty insane to just hear all everything going on and everybody said. So when she's at school, it's like just this cacophony, but she very clearly hears somebody's thoughts tomorrow. I'm going to kill them all. Mm hmm. And so they begin this investigative track to find out, figure out who would want to kill everybody at school. And on that day, they have not figured it out. And so they've narrowed down to a few suspects, but they aren't, they don't really know. But she sees up in the bell tower of the school, which if you are old enough, you remember the very first kind of school shooting that most people probably know about and which Bob Geldof wrote a song about was the gal who was, who, um, I think she was up in a bell tower to school yeah. and when they asked her why she did it. She said, I hate Mondays or I don't like Mondays. Yeah. I could be mixing up my school shootings. Sadly, there are enough of them that I could be. Um, but anyway, that was yeah. definitely evoking a past incident. Yeah. So she of course gets up there quick as a blink and she sees this nebishy kind of um, nebishy guy up there and she basically gets him away, you know, tackles him a little bit, but, um, she starts to like, like any good person in a position of power should do with greater skills and power and firepower. She decides to deescalate mm -hmm. and try to talk to him. And she's trying to, you know, she says his name and she, she tries to figure out, um, what's happening. And then he's like, don't act like you're my friend. You don't even know who I am. You don't care about me. You don't care about anything. Everybody, nobody likes me. Everyone thinks I'm whatever, mm -hmm. you know, a, a nerd, blah, 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 blah. And I mean, she comes to realize he was up there to kill himself, not kill everybody else yeah. because every, because he's convinced everybody thinks he's a nerd and, and nobody cares about him. And she sort of has this monologue where she says to him, you know, you think that it's so easy for people that you think are more beautiful than you or more mm -hmm. popular than you or more, you know, whatever than you, athletic than you, but that's not the case. Everybody down there, and they're looking down at the school quad or whatever, everybody down there is dealing with their own stuff. They're not thinking about you at all. You're right. right. They're, they're not thinking about you because they are totally caught up in their own shit, basically. Mm -hmm. And, um, and anyway, she obviously ultimately talks him down. They figure out that the cafeteria lady was pouring rat poison in the chili or whatever, and it was totally someone else. But um, that always stuck with me that that no one is thinking about you the way that you think they are. Yeah. You, I have, you know, I am sure I am not alone when there are things I think about that I've done that embarrass me mm -hmm. and are, are cringy moments in my life, yeah. right? And you, you can call, I can call those up so easily and just tell myself, oh my God, that was so like, how could you even do that? That was right. so embarrassing. It's so humiliating. They must think I'm such a jerk. They must think I'm such an asshole. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. And you know what? They probably, A, who knows if they even noticed it at the time. Right. If they did. They probably forgot about it momentarily. Yep. You know, like, but I, I try to tell myself that, but you know what? I still can obsess about these things. And so just in life to assume that no one is actually obsessing about your flaws and faults and missteps and embarrassments, um, like you are, y right. you, you corner the market on that. Mm -hmm. You know what? They're all thinking about theirs. Yep. They have their own set of obsessions, Right. But I also think about, uh, I also apply that to like a business um, professional uh, perspective because in negotiation, 
you know, there's a part of traditional negotiation coaching that's very, very art of war, win, lose, mm-hmm. you got to get, you got to win. Um, and you got to get something over on the other person, but I'm like, who wants to partner with someone, you know, who wants to be in a partnership where one of you feels like you're losing. And right. a lot of times when people come to you with maybe the rate of pay they're offering you or some other aspect of a negotiation. And just, this just happened to me recently because I'm renting a condo and I had said, this is the lowest we can go. Yeah. And then they asked for a lower rent. Now, a part of me could be like, oh my fucking God, I said that was the lowest I could go. Yeah. Like they're, they're, what are they trying to do to me? Yeah. Like what are they, what's their angle? Like, why would they do that? They're not listening. They, you know, they think I'm a liar. I said what it was. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, you know, no, they probably were just doing their budget and hoping that maybe right. I changed my mind. Yeah. Or maybe I said that, but they thought, oh, that's probably you know, she's saying that, but everybody does negotiation differently. I got to ask because you get these competing things, which is listen, listen to who you're negotiating with, but also never take the first answer, right? right? There's always room for negotiation. So given that we're all being given all this, I'm cursing a lot. Is that okay on your It is allowed. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Given that we're all filled with this bullshit um, coaching about negotiation, Mm -hmm. why don't we just take a step back and assume that anything someone comes to you with, it's not because they're trying to do something to you. It's not because they're trying to pull it over on you. Maybe they're just really asking for what they want. Right. And you have to ask for what you want. And you know what? Maybe you won't ever agree. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe you will, but you can take out, you can depersonalize this, um, this aspect of thinking that it's a battle, that it's this purposeful battle of wits. I hate that positioning of negotiation. We all want to win. And if we want this, if we want outcomes that can live next to each other, we can find a way to win. I just really don't believe in, like, if someone wants to do something with me, okay, well, I'm like, here's what I need. What do you need? Can I deliver it? You know, here's what I need. Can you deliver it? Um, and, and it's part of that same depersonalize it. They're not thinking about you the way they're thinking about their own Mm -hmm. goals. They're thinking about their own needs. They're really not sitting there conspiring to ignore what you said or treat you like it wasn't that you didn't mean it. Yeah. They've probably been filled up with some sort of BS negotiation coaching and, Right. And so I kind of can apply that lesson, just always kind of step back and say, you know what? They're really not sitting around thinking about ways to upset you, make you angry, screw right. you. And if you meet someone who is doing all of that, <laughs> then run away, then run away. stop the negotiating. But, yes. But usually, that is your answer. <laughs> yes. But usually <laughs> they're not, you know, it's really not about you. It's about them and what they need. So, so ironically, I find it very disarming mm-hmm. to start by getting someone I'm negotiating with to just tell me everything they want and need or to start by saying, I bet you want this. And that's totally easily done. What else? Mm -hmm. You know, I think people just aren't used to others being able to say, oh yeah, I can do some of the stuff you need. Like, right. Yeah. Why wouldn't I? Right. That's why we're all here to figure out how we can help each other. And I don't think people often know what to do if you're just really that direct and cards on the table and upfront and giving in your first approach. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is hard for people to, to get there because we have been taught when I'm negotiating, one of the things I've, I've learned is that like, you don't get what you don't ask for. Right. So, right. They did have to say, well, what about this lower price? But also, you know, I, I, uh, in this pandemic went from a uh, contractor to full time, um, which is wild. Wow. Yeah. And, but I, it was a, a client I'd been contracting with for a year already. And so I was mm-hmm. like, I would just like for my PTO to reflect the year of service I've already given you. As we count up some of these things, can we acknowledge that I've already been here for a year? And, and like, for me, I, and I talked to my friends about it later because I had to get like gassed up to be like, we all do this. Like, oh, it's big and scary. And they're like, of course, you've been here. We love you. We want you to be happy. Like, and yeah. it was 
such a change of pace to go into a negotiation where we all felt like we were on the same team. And the goal is like a positive long term working relationship. And it was really nice. No, that's great. Yeah. I think there's there's countless examples where that can happen and we attach a lot of, there's so much stuff attached to asking for things, mm-hmm. or offering things, also offering things. Yeah. You know, and um, like, here's an interesting one. Uh, as a manager, when I'm hiring someone, mm-hmm. I have a salary range I'm thinking of. And my first offer is almost always less than what I could ultimately do. Right. Because I want them to ask me for more and then I want to be able to give it to them. Yeah. Now, not everybody asks for more. So then I always, that's why I always tell people, you've got to ask for more from whatever the first offer is. Right. And let them say no, because most people are probably expecting you to ask for more. And I've, so I don't, I actually do not know if I'm just weird and I, that I always used to do that. And, or, or um, if that's a, like a normal thing, because I haven't done like a survey of what people do. What I would tell people going into negotiations is if you're going to work, if your goal is to work there a long time, like all future raises are based on your first salary. So yeah. you've got to get the first salary up as high as you can. So you yeah. always have to ask for more money because it's always, always a percentage of that. Your promotion's yeah. a percentage of your first negotiated salary. Yeah. Like, so you got to go, you've got to try. But then I've been on the other side of, of offering a position where like, cause I, you know, when I go to like a market where you're supposed to haggle, you know, I bought a new dishwasher recently and I went to this really famous Chicago store called apt electronics where you're supposed to haggle. Oh my God. And I not was like, I, uh, I'm like, I was I one want... of the first Saturn buyers, Leah. I do not like haggling. <laughs> I don't either. If I'm at a market, if I'm at a market in another country, I'm like, just please don't make me do the thing. Don't make me like <laughs> ask for a price and do the fake walkout and come back and you chase me and we have coffee. Like, uh, just tell me the price. I just won't pay the price. <laughs> um, so sometimes I take that approach when I'm negotiating where I'm like, I'm just going to be very honest with you. This is this is the band. This is the best offer. I don't want to I don't want us to hurt each other's feelings in negotiating this offer. So like I'm going to come truly with my best and if my best isn't where you need to be then maybe it will be in a couple years and we'll come back together. Like that is sometimes how I because I I hate a negotiation. I hate a haggle. Uh and I just I just want to like know the price and be good. Yeah. 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 That's a good one too. So you did say you're loving, you're like a big TV pop culture person. Yes. So what are the things, what have been your uh, COVID rewatches or loves? Well, like I said, we did the whole Marvel Universe 23 movies. That is. And that was awesome. Amazing. And then I loved WandaVision. Which oh, it was so good. I, I, Falcon and Winter Soldier was not as good. Mm-hmm. But I watched it. Yeah. Um, so sort of all into that. Ted Lasso was amazing. I had never watched Schitt's Creek. So I watched Schitt's Creek oh, for the first time during so this nice. pandemic. Yeah. And then I also, because one of my big habits that I wanted to refine my ability to do was read during the pandemic. I lo- first year, I did not read at all. Not even like magazine articles. Like I couldn't read I anything can't. long form. Yeah. So my big habit I wanted to change was read. So I I set a habit of like, I want to read at least 20 minutes a day. Um, and I set a habit that I'm going to try audiobooks too to see mm-hmm. if those work. So I just finished my 23rd book of the year yesterday. Outstanding. And some of what I'm doing is like, I'm reading all of Agatha Christie again, because I read so much of it when I was young. Yeah. That's pretty wacky to do. Uh, I'm going through, I don't know how long I'll last. I'm reading the Temperance Brennan, the Bones books. Okay. Uh, But she's so not like the TV show. It's so not like Bones, the TV show, which I enjoyed that. And it's pretty gruesome. I mean, the TV show was gruesome too, but it was kind of in a lighter package. 
um, the, this, the books are really gruesome, like really digging into the gruesome. And so cool. I don't know how long I'll last there. Yeah. But so far, I'm up to like book six or seven. How um, many books are there that you can I, be at book six or seven and you're not sure you're going to stick with it? I don't know. I don't know how <laughs> many books there are. But you know, Agatha Christie, they're like a hundred books, right? right? I'm only into book three or four. Um, so I've been, I've been doing that. Um, what else have I been watching? Um, I've just, oh, I've been watching tons of documentaries, the Britney Spear, framing Britney Spear. Mm, yeah. Um, that creepy, creepy octopus movie that everybody else loves, but I think is creepy, creepy. I, I, th I already think octopuses, octopi, like I have actually a fair amount of octopus art. There's a local artist who does. Oh. He does, he does something called the Octophant, where it's an elephant with, like, octopus tentacles. and How interesting. It's cool. Uh, but I do think, uh, I already think they're creepy smart. And I my impression is that documentary would terrify me. Of No, that's not what bothers me about, about it. What bothers me about it is that the, the guy, yeah. he gets obsessed with this octopus and it's creepy. Like one and particular he, like, animal? One octopus. And he, so, it, okay, spoiler alert. Yeah. Um, um, <laughs> so at one point he scares the octopus. I forget how now. And it, it abandons its home and like runs away or swims away or, you know, whatever, propels itself yeah. away and disappears. And he goes on this hunt for this octopus. He must find this octopus. And I'm like, dude, the octopus said no. The octopus right. was like, I'm done with you. And he just can't let it go. Then he finds the octopus again and he likes to touch the octopus and have the octopus with its tentacles on him. And I just was so triggered. I don't know why, but I just found the whole vibe. Like he was, it was such a stalker and nobody takes me seriously. Okay, that's not true. When I posted about this finally, I did find people who agreed with me, but I swear, everyone that else saw it as weird. this like poetic, lyrical look at how, you know, we can commune with nature. And I'm like, that's not communing. He was like stalking and then obsessing. And, and meanwhile, he's got a wife and kid, right? He's like, he's seen the, the, the documentary makes it seem like he's spending hours just thinking about this octopus and like, <laughs> what's up with his family? Um, so, so I... So Did he's not, not like, like a marine biologist working in a aquarium. So this is not an aquarium octopus. This even. is in the wild. He lives in Australia or New Zealand or something. And he's a photojournalist. Right. He's a nature photo. He had done a lot of nature photojournalism. Huh. And yeah, it becomes all about. And then ultimately, oh, oh, after he stalks the, spoiler alert again, he stalks the octopus He's all into the octopus, but when then she's in actual danger at one point from a predator, he decides he shouldn't interfere with nature. Dude, you've been putting her tentacles on your arm and stuff and like finding her by doing the coordinates of the, like, now you don't want to interfere with nature. Now you found your octopus again. Like now let, let it be whatever happens. I was so pissed about that. Ugh. And then she has babies and dies and he thinks it's that just, you know, that's very poetic for him. And I'm like, well, that is just nature, but there's, you're, you're anthropomorphizing that a lot to make it some sort of poetic, you know, it's like Charlotte at the end of, oh, spoiler that's alert again. Yeah, I, That's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. I was like, this is a man who read Charlotte's Web one too many times and thinks <laughs> <Yeah>. he's Wilbur. <laughs> spoiler alert. <laughs> some pig. <laughs> Anyway, I and I don't know who he reminds me of, but I think he must remind me of someone that I find creepy in life because I just was really he gave me the heebie-jeebies. Oh, <laughs> and now wow. it's won an Oscar. Right. Uh anyway, so <laughs> yeah, I have been watching uh well the circle is back on Netflix. Which it's on is, my list, but I've never, I haven't started it. Well, I, so a year ago, right before the pandemic started, Netflix, man, I, Netflix manifested the pandemic because right before it started, they, there was The Circle, which is a TV show about people living alone in isolation, only communicating through a social network. 
quickly followed by Love is Blind, a TV show about people living in isolation who can only do romantic partnerships over the phone and you don't get to meet each other in person until you decide you're going to get married. Wow. And and those were the two big shows that Netflix launched in like January, February last year. And we were like, Oh my God, these shows where people have to like live alone in isolation and have, and it just seemed so wild. And then within weeks we were all living these two reality shows. Well, that's an interesting theory, Leah. Yeah. I, it's a lot of power to give Netflix. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but it's it's back and they shot it during COVID and but they have there are no mentions of COVID in the whole thing. So it's well, definitely just- got a different vibe because these are people who were, you know, quarantining, living pandemic life for six to eight months before they went on this reality show. But they've edited all of it out. But there's one guy in the cast who's early 50s gay man who every time someone gets cut from the show, he just sobs. And I'm like, that's someone who lived through the AIDS crisis, who's living through another pandemic, who's deeply connecting with people. And all of that part is being edited out of the show. And I think it's really wild. Wow. Wow. Um, Also, I live alone and uh, I think a lot about TV. (laughs) Well, I don't live alone, but I have an opposite schedule from my significant other who is a night owl and I'm a morning person. So we intersect for about three hours in the evening. That's about it, including on the weekends, which is less than desirable. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so I watch a lot of TV. I started watching Sex in the City. I don't know how far I'll get with that. Um, it gets better. The first season when they're doing like the speaking the weird the- cutaway interview yeah. man on the street stuff. That, yeah. They drop that by season two. And the speaking good. to the camera. Yeah. What else? Have you watched? Know. Ted Lasso was my big discovery. Oh, so good. Great um, British baking show. They yes. need desperately need new episodes. Call the Midwife. I finally got into that and watched all nine seasons. I t- t- everyone I know who watches it loves it. They they're so excited every time a new season comes on. I tried to watch the pilot. They got to the uh they were about to do the enema. <laughs> and I was like, I am show that. I'm out. Well, they I didn't mentioned- know. I didn't know what they were going to show. I'm telling you now, they mentioned okay. that a handful of times, but they never show one. Okay. And having just watched Nomadland, where I watched Francis McDormand shit in a bucket, you know, like I feel like I've been hardened. <laughs> but no, Call the Midwife is hilarious because um, uh, my spouse made the rule that you can't, I couldn't watch it when we were eating. Fair. Um, because I think that's every a fair episode. Rule. Every episode has some birth with screaming. And and also because they're a night owl, they work late. Yeah. So I'm knocking off for the day, but they are not. And they're working in the dining room, which is, you know, adjacent to our living room where the TV mm-hmm. is. So I started watching it with the volume way down, but subtitles, which is kind of helpful anyway, because of all the accents. Right. Um, anyway, yes, we could no longer watch it uh, because every episode does have a birth. I do not have children and never wanted them. And nothing mm-hmm. about this show makes me want to go through that process. Yeah. Or makes me re- regret my decision. <laughs> but, yeah. But but it is really good. And it does cover every kind of human emotion, usually in one episode. And it's very. And it starts in the, does it start in the 30s? Like it's through the decades of. Post-war. I, so post-war. late 40s, okay. early 50s, I think. I retained nothing other than I was like, I don't want to watch an enema. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> you don't have to. Yeah. It's okay. The only other thing that really, the real world reunion on Paramount Plus. I would watch a real world San Francisco reunion, but I did not watch real world New York. I did not care. Okay. But real world San Francisco was the real deal. Yeah. Pam and Judd have been married for like 20 plus years. I know. I follow yeah. him on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. And like Puck, the original villain, 
Oh, yeah. See, that was San Francisco. That was San Francisco. All the best stuff. Yeah. And Pedro, of course. Yes. Yeah, I would. Those first couple seasons, I would I would accept a reunion on those first few seasons. It was was, it's just six episodes. So as we as we start to wrap up, is is there anything about Buffy that I didn't ask you that when we hang up, you'll be like, I can't believe I didn't I didn't tell her about this episode or this other idea or. I think Buffy takes the issues. It definitely takes issues that we deal with, not just as adolescents, but adults Mm -hmm. and manifest them in different ways. There's so much messaging about not judging books by their cover. Yeah. Uh, It's starting with her. You know, that was his, Joss Whedon's whole thing was that he thought it would be awesome to have like the typical blonde teenage Southern California girl who is treated like a dumb blonde in most media and have her instead be kick-ass, kick-ass and empowered and strong without losing you know, male gaze. Thank you, yeah. I guess, without losing being blonde and all those right. things that, that you couldn't, you couldn't judge that book by its cover. And that's true throughout the show. Like so there are some, you know, that it's like a lyric from Sondheim, which, which is, can be good. Um, giants can be right. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, well, demon, there's some demons that are good characters. There's some vampires who have souls. There's, um, there's a lot of more than meets the eye um, to it. And sometimes it is not the supernatural that is our biggest impediment. Sometimes it's ourselves and it's our own humanity, whether it's our own bodies, um, you know, or Mm -hmm. our own, you know, ways that we're thinking. So to me, it has really evocative, poignant messages, um, no matter your age and throughout and, um, and, and really important, I think, inspiring uh, guide guidance really to, to look for your team yep, and to look for the compromise and look for the, what everyone can contribute at their highest level. Mm-hmm. And when everyone is contributing the thing they're best at, yeah. you, you know, you can't be stopped and, um, you know, and you can still have fun. Cause I always say when people ask me, um, you know, what would the people who've worked for you, what would they say about you? And I'm like, oh, that they would say I was fair, that I was clear about what was expected, mm-hmm. that I had their back and that we had fun. Yeah. And I think that's really important, especially if you're in a high stress situation, like, you know, hunting vampires or whatever. Yeah. Or deep. Um, and so the, all that snappy dialogue and the fun repartee to me was, was a lesson also for life, which is, you know, have some fun. Yeah. Um, it's all going to be over in a flash at some point. So, or in a, in, in some dust as, as the vampires get uh, slayed, they, yeah, they explode into some dust. So we're all going to end up dust. Yeah. Um, so have some fun while you're at it. Fantastic. Well, this has been a blast. Um, where can people find you online? Find the newsletter, the book, the podcast. Okay. Uh, I am at Elisa C on Twitter at Elisa CP on Insta. Uh, at Elisa, um, elisacp.com is my website. elisacp.substack.com is my newsletter. The podcast is the op-ed page podcast, which you can find everywhere you listen to podcasts. Um, gosh, that's, I, I, I even have one video on TikTok at Elisa CP, my cat. Right. It's a cat video. Of course it's a cat video. I also have one TikTok of my cat and it's the why look at that distinguished gentleman how he sits (laughs) mine was i saw i had just gone to this little online webinar about using tiktok which made it look like it was not that hard and then they had a hard uh, (laughs) at the end of the day it wasn't that bad but they had a thing going around which is you know you share this the last video of your cat with this music and it was the swan Camille Saint-Saëns Swan. Uh Um, And so I happened to have a video of my very chubby cat rolling around on her back and then rolling over and stretching her leg up to, um, (laughs) and you're missing the visuals podcast listeners, but I'm imitating my roly poly cat rolling around on her back and then lifting her leg up to lick it all to this very melodious swan music. And it's very beautiful. I'm like, I have no followers on TikTok and it had 600 views and 90 likes by the next day. And I'm like, yeah. what the hell? <laughs> like, that's kind of amazing. Cause I use cats of TikTok hashtags. 
Yeah. All about the hashtags. Yeah. Well, and TikTok wants to get you that that high. Dopamine. They want, they want you Got to it. get that, that dopamine. dopamine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've got a weird, I, I have a couple, I don't know. I'm going to say for like, I had TikTok on my phone around the election and I was like, oh, I can't be trusted with TikTok on my phone because I cannot put it down. The oh yeah. I didn't even is, bring up that TikTok is one of the things that brought me joy in this pandemic. It's yeah. just fun. I watch so dancing, fun. dancing and cats and maybe llamas and goats and dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of animals, lots of dancing. I don't really need to watch anything else. Maybe some people that are doing some comedy stuff, but mostly animals and dancing. Thank you for listening to Finding Favorites with Leah Jones. Please make sure to subscribe and drop us a five-star review on iTunes. Now, go out and enjoy your favorite things.